Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Battle Walks. Uh, my loyal co-host, Pete Smith, is tied up, as always, walking the ground. He's actually doing it in a real sense. So for two years, we've enjoyed hear him, hearing from him in a virtual sense. Well, now he's tied up actually walking the ground and leading tours, which is extremely exciting. Uh, so we're continuing our series of special guest hosts. And I'm joined this week by the gentleman who did a couple of outstanding, three outstanding episodes, in fact, for us recently on the Kokoda track. He is a man who knows these Pacific battlefields better than just about anyone. And uh, it's great to continue this series of walking the Pacific battlefields as we do Milne Bay, a really famous battle, particularly for Australian troops against the Japanese in 1942. So welcome once again to David Howell. G'day, Matt. Great to be back. I can see you've got a whole new recording set up there as well, mate, which is great. If anyone's watching this on video on YouTube, you can see that David's got a whole new recording set up. So a new era in sound quality, uh, reflecting uh, the uh, the number of great podcasts you've been doing with us, mate. So we it's been fantastic. The Kokoda episodes were so well received. I think compared to what we've done in the past on Battle Walks, which I've loved doing, Gallipoli, the Western Front, a bit of Normandy, it was really interesting to get outside our sort of comfort zone and do these battlefields of the Pacific because they're – they're important, but not often visited, aren't they? No, they're not. In fact, um, this year, being the 80th anniversary of the battles fought in Papua, uh, it is very important to not just talk about Kokoda, but the other uh, four battles that took place 80 years ago. So we're doing Milne Bay today, which is also in New Guinea, but not part of the Kokoda campaign. Why don't you just give us one of your excellent uh, a brief history, just outlining what happened at Milne Bay and, and why it was so significant? Well, in essence, uh, Milne Bay, if you could imagine, is on the side of Papua. This is the lower lower part of Papua New Guinea with Port Moresby down the bottom as the centre. There was five battles, as I said, fought uh, in what was then the Australian territory of um, of Papua, and that was the Kokoda one that we've already covered, the three battles at the beachheads, Buna, Gona and San Ananda, and, of course, the subject today, which is Milne Bay. And Milne Bay was basically an attempt it, it happened concurrently to um, the Kokoda campaign. So when the fighting at Isarava, where Bruce Kingsbury got the VC, this was happening on the side of New Guinea. And basically, it was a Japanese attempt to break through and capture the airfields at Milne Bay. And had they done that, uh, they would have been part of the overall attack uh, on trying to take Port Moresby. And the Japanese, had they been successful, not only would they have got those valuable airstrips, but they would have been able to well, their plan would have been to break through and help support the Kokoda operations to capture the prize that they had in mind, which is, of course, Port Moresby. We hear about these airfields all the time, David, when we talk about the Pacific battles. It seems that every battle that we, we hear about was to do with an airstrip or either capturing or building an airstrip or having control of the air. Is that a fair assessment that, that so much of the Pacific War revolved around this concept of air power and being able to dominate airfields and the skies over these Pacific islands? Indeed. And to quote General MacArthur himself, who said of Australia, the unsinkable aircraft carrier, the idea that you could get aircraft. So it was. It certainly was um, a, a war at sea in the Pacific for most of the time. But of course, just like we um, uh, would would remember of the Battle of Coral Sea and things like that, where you get aircraft carriers sending aircraft up to fight one another, in essence, having airstrips forward um, on ground to the north to go and uh, meet any uh, threat from the sea was vitally important. And the Allies had recognised this very early in the war. And indeed, with the Kokoda campaign, um, before the Kokoda pa campaign kicks off, that's what Australian soldiers, with with uh, the idea to support American engineers coming in to build forward northern air airfields. And indeed, Milne Bay had been selected as a site to put these air bases. So the idea is that you could send up aircraft to go and meet any um, uh, you know force that was coming to to invade, and that's that's what it was all about. And it can work in either either um, the enemy or the allies favor of course not not to forget what was happening at the same time that Kokoda and Milne Bay Battle of Gorda Canal Henderson Airfield again over an airfield you have your airfields forward you can go out and meet the threat from the sea those of us that have studied the Pacific War as well know that um, Milne Bay the, the, the thing I love about this is it was such a such a, a, a linked tapestry is that throughout the Guadalcanal campaign aircraft from Milne Bay, 
were doing really important work in terms of spotting Japanese fleets and advising when Japanese planes were coming over. So the, the it wasn't just that these islands were in isolation and just doing their own thing. They all worked very closely together. And so every time I read about um, you know the importance of Milne Bay during the Guadalcanal campaign for these extended uh, reconnaissance missions, I think of how important it was that Milne Bay didn't fall into Japanese hands in 1942 during this battle. Indeed. In fact, there was a network throughout the Pacific stretching all through the islands of New Guinea into Guadalcanal, the Solomon Islands, uh, of coast watchers who would, their very job was to report on Japanese movements. And, um, you know, they were vital to early detection. In fact, um, there has been a lot of crossover between what the Americans were doing over in the Solomon Islands, what we were doing, in addition with with, with the Americans, of course, in, in the Australian territory of Papua, which is very important because this is our soil at this time. And, you know, through this network of coast watchers and people just simply watching what the Japanese were up to, um, you know, it made a huge difference in building an intelligence picture uh, to be able to fight the enemy. So very important. So just give us a very quick overview of what actually happened on the ground at Milne Bay. So this was this was Japanese special naval landing forces, wasn't it, that 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 that, that fought in this action. It wasn't Japanese army forces. Just tell us a little bit about what the Japanese did and the Australian response. Yeah, indeed. It was a it was a navy, a Japanese navy um, led operation and the operation uh, was for the Japanese was to land uh, a force and to take um, the airfields. There were three airfields. Um, they weren't all completed by the time the Japanese had invaded. The, the battle goes from the 21st of uh, correction, the 25th of August until the 7th of September in 1942. To put that in perspective, the 26th of August is when the Battle of Isarava is raging up in the um, Owen Stanleys, as I said before, where Kingsbury got the VC. So that's going on at that time. The Japanese um, had uh, committed a force that was designed to land on, on. So they were Marines, for want of a better term. They weren't actually called Marines. They were Special Naval Landing Force, as you said, Matt, but they were to land um, basically in Milne Bay itself on the side where the activity is um, and head west along to capture these airfields. And they brought with them landing barges. They had these Daihatsu landing barges, which were pretty good. The Japanese were very good at um, this amph- amphibious type of, of warfare. And as I said, they were to make their way along um, the road. They didn't quite know exactly the distance of where the airfields were or what the operational status of them were, but they had their objective in sight to um, to take them. And that's what they did. They brought um, two tanks with them, tankettes, Hago tanks, one's, one that was actually captured at Milne Bay, you can see in a marvellous display at the Australian War Memorial. And so the Japanese um, job was to go along what was... Um, a road which you would see there on the walking tour. It's it's a tarmac now, but at the time it was um, made out of corduroy with the um, uh, coconut palms and um, uh, um, trunks laid down on the road and they were to make their way along uh, from these landing barges and, um, and take these airfields. They encountered uh, quite strong resistance from both Australian AIF forces and militia forces. There was two brigades up there, one of AIF and one of militia. And they were also um, had American engineers working on the airfield. And, of course, one of the things that really um, um, got to the Japanese, of course, is that we had um, our squadrons of Kitty Hawk 75 and 76 squadrons. And we also had uh, number 6 and 32 squadrons operating uh, Hudson bombers. So that did hamper the, the Japanese. But it's very important, uh, I guess, to think that uh, like all these battles, um, like the Kokoda track and and, and Milne Bay in particular, it is very linear. They start at, at, at one point, they make their way towards another point and they get turned back. And that's exactly what happened in this battle. They make their way towards the airfields, they get very, very close, and then we push them back. The Allies push them back and basically push them back into the sea. And as I said, it doesn't go for as long as some of the other uh, battles, but it was a very decisive battle. And I should add that it does have the claim, I guess, that this is the first time that... Um, the Allies defeat the Japanese on land, not at sea, but very important to make that distinction, but the first time that the Imperial Japanese had been beaten on land. Well, that was going to be my next question, David, that I've heard those claims, um, and my question was going to be, do are they accurate, those claims? And I take it from that statement that you, you feel that is a, uh, a very accurate assessment. I think it's fair to say... It's a real, it's the biggest, there are other activities going on in the Second World War where you could have the claim to it, but certainly 
uh, Milne Bay was a decisive battle. It was won on land, although it came from a seaborne invasion. It was won on land, and it was, in my mind, there was no question that um, had the Japanese broken through at Milne Bay, it would have um, made it would have turned the tide to a certain point in in what the operation MO of the Japanese to take Port Moresby as they they failed when they tried to do it through their seaborne invasion. That's the Battle of the Coral Sea. They were they would only just started. Um, on the, they were still on the forefront in Kokoda. They were only fighting down close to Kokoda. Isarabra is, is really the next big village out of Kokoda. And had the Japanese broken through there, certainly would have made a, 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 a change in the outcome, I believe. And so they were defeated and they were defeated on land. So a decisive battle ends in defeat for the Japanese, happens on land, I'd be happy for, for us to draw the line in the sand mat and say this is the first decisive battle of the Japanese being um, stopped on land. Well, you don't get more definitive than that. Let's draw that line and let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, take that claim to the bank. Um, now, this land that we're going to be walking, I mean, that was a great assessment of it. And thank you, David, the, the significance of the land we're going to be walking. It's not necessarily easy to get to, is it? How are we even, you know, we're not, uh, we're not walking out of our, hotel in downtown Port Moresby and finding ourselves on the uh, on the battlefield of Milne Bay. How are we even getting to this place? Well, I'm glad you mentioned this because although we're not having to trek like we did on Kokoda and get our backpacks on and start climbing up big mountains, uh, it is difficult uh, to get to because you have to fly there. And um, it's, it is probably the most cancelled uh, flights in PNG, I would say. I'd say it'd almost be safe to say it's the most cancelled flight because the weather changes. Indeed, the weather had a role to play in the battle itself. But um, many a times I've left Port Moresby from Jackson's Airfield to fly out to um, <clears throat> uh, Number One Strip or Gurney Field. So one of the airstrips from the war is the wartime strip that commercial planes land in. And of course, if you don't get out there uh, when the weather's right, even today, the planes turn around and they come back to Moresby. And indeed, I've had tours where we've had to wait for the next day for the weather to clear to get in there. So we get on our light plane, we fly in. Hopefully, the weather's clear on our virtual <laughs> adventure there today. And uh, we land at uh, Gurney Field, number one strip. Um, so so tell, us what, uh, tell us about coming in. What's it like to land there on this former wartime strip at this far-flung well, outpost of New Guinea? Look, the first thing, as you you know, you take off in the plane, you're looking out the clouds and whatever, and as you come in on the approach, the thing that I should say about Milne Bay, all of the, there's some wonderful harbours in the world that I've had the opportunity to visit. And I would say Milne Bay is one of the most um, amazing bays that I've ever been over. And um, I mean, it would probably equal, um, in my mind, to uh, Rabaul. Um, and Simpson Harbour up there. It is a magnificent, um, a lot of people in tourism not going there for battles would go there to surf. I'm not a surfer, but it's got a resort there. It's a beautiful place in itself. So as you approach it, um, you, you see this magnificent, just think of this picturesque, uh, tropical, um, you know, with the, the different colours of the water where you get the, um, you know, the, the greens and then the light blues and all of that. It's a magnificent place if the weather's clear. And when you land and you arrive at um, at Gurney Field or Number One Strip, um, as I said, it, it is the wartime or what where the wartime strip was. Obviously, it's built up now and it's... Um, it's got a proper tarmac on it. But the first thing, as soon as you get out of the plane, is you cannot be helped but sense the Second World War because they've got a Bofors anti-aircraft gun. They've got um, several propellers of, of planes all here in the um, on the tarmac as you get out. In fact, the only time you can see those items is uh, is when you get off the plane to go through the terminal. It's just amazing. And we were discussing before this uh, this recording. I mean, I haven't been to Milne Bay and I was talking to you about how we were going to tackle the tour. And I think the exciting thing is we decided you could either drive this as most people do, or, but you could walk this, couldn't you, in a, in, a, in a long day if you're feeling fit and the weather was cooperative. You, you could actually walk this battlefield. So it's not it's not a massive area we're talking about. How, how long would the walk be if you decided to actually walk the uh, the entire battlefield? It, look, it, it's well, the first thing is it's flat, which makes a change for things in the Pacific. Um, but it would probably it would take the best you know if we if you got there start there in the morning and finished um, down at the crossroads uh, where the other VC action that we'll get to 
later happened. Uh, it would take the it would take most of the day of stopping with the lunch at the at the main memorial in the center of center of the town. But it is as I said, you're basically walking. Uh, left to right on on the map and it's it's the best part of a day but but it's easy and it's very achievable uh, because as I said it's you're walking along a road in fact the modern road that's there now um, cuts through where the road was basically during the war it's just that it's got um, gravel down on it now it's got a hard surface well there's some very famous photos of course particularly of tanks you know discarded on the side of the road and and Australian troops. So let's begin our tour, David. So we've come in at the airstrip. So as I said, we're either driving or walking this. It doesn't matter for our virtual tour. Both uh, both options are, are available. Uh, so we've arrived at the airstrip. So we're already in the thick of the World War II history. Uh, where are we heading uh, for our next stop on the tour? So from the airstrip, and it's and it's and it's important to put this into perspective. We're going to head east. So we're, I guess, following the um, the uh, path of the Allies or the Australians in this case, pushing um, the Japanese back. So the Japanese obviously came in the other direction. So we're going, we're starting west and we're heading heading east um, towards the town of Milne Bay and we're actually going to walk beyond, beyond the town. If you can imagine, if you drew a line on a piece of paper, in the centre would be the town. We're at the le- left side and we're going to walk to the to the right side. And as I said before, it's probably the best, it is, it's the best part of a day's walk. And like like we say often when we do these battle walks is um, get a map out and see, you know, trace it on the on a map on, on your computer or on a paper map and you, it'll uh, it'll make a lot more sense. So uh, what are we, uh, firstly, are there, is there anything more to see at the Strip once we've landed? Are there any sites in and around the Strip that we should check out before we uh, before we move on? Not immediately. As I said, most of the war, um, I like the Bofors anti-aircraft gun, to, to my mind, is uh, pretty special because um, there is another famous photo. You mentioned a photo before of Milne Bay where the tanks are, um, and we'll get to that on our walk. But if you could imagine, um, for my mind, one of the, the, the iconic images of Milne Bay for me is some Australian soldiers sitting in like this, this, this dugout area with some sandbags. They've got their tin helmets on. They're, at, they're on the side of the airstrip and they've got you know, the two guys on the side and someone looking with binoculars or whatever on the Bofors anti-aircraft gun guarding the airfield. And um, one of those Bofors guns, as I said, is um, is there as a as an adornment to the to the runway. And um, it's pretty, it's not quite the same as uh, what we'd see in Australia. You usher you out, you land on the tarmac um, and um, you have time. You know, people can take their cameras out and take photos. As I said, there's a there's a couple of uh, big ticket items. The Bofors being the biggest one, some propellers and things that were left over from the war. So, as I said, hits you, but that's all, and it's on the tarmac side. We go through the uh, terminal, get the bags, and you leave the airport, and you turn right, and you're on the battlefield. So what's uh, what's the next thing we're going to see on our tour, David? So the next thing that we're going to see of note as we go is we're going to walk so we're we're um basically um as i said we're on the on the airstrip which is um a, a gurney there which is the the number one strip the number the second um airstrip is um because you have to understand now after the war that it's palm oil there's a lot of palm oil in the pacific and um you know it gets a bit of controversy but milne bay has a lot of palm oil growing in and around where the battlefield was um the uh, airstrip that um, uh, that we leave, as I said, is there. But um, the other air, uh, other two airstrips, only one uh, other one sort of exists. That's number three strip. Number three strip um, uh, is got the road going through the middle of it, and obviously the palm oil, and that's taken over. So you can't. You can see because if you look at a wartime photo, because it points directly out into into the bay. And this is where the Japanese were actually actually stopped. And there is one of two memorials, um, main memorials, if you will. So there's no cemetery at Milne Bay. Uh, the people who lost their lives and have graves are back in um, in Port Moresby at Bamana. But but number three strip has um, part of it left, I guess, and that has got a. Um, uh, a memorial there but it's also got uh i guess the, the the thing that interests one of the things that interests me the most is one of the japanese mountain guns like what we saw or heard about in the kokoda campaign and there's quite a, a few things um you know in this park i guess for want of a better term it's not a cemetery but there is memorial especially to the um um to the the fighting uh the kitty hawk uh, squadrons that we had up there 
and um, yeah, you can see, as I said, you can go up and touch the Japanese mountain gun, and it's um, it's quite it's quite impressive. As as things go in the Pacific, it's very well looked after, and um, it's uh, it's it certainly you know hits you in the face that hang on a second, this is a war, and then you turn around, you look to see where the road is, and you realise, oh, hang on, this is a flat area. Of course, this is where, and when I say flat, I mean flat as in you can see that it was still, you know, it's been graded for, for a runway and you can say, okay, I'm, I'm actually on the airfield now. And there was some, actually some pretty tough fighting around that airstrip, wasn't there? I, I recall reading about the Americans chipped in with some 50 cal guns or 30 cal guns and, 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 and really helped as well. So we think of this as an Australian action, but those American engineers that were there also uh, played their part too in fighting around the airfield, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, we d- definitely can't um, forget um, um, the U.S. Army's um, 46 Engineering Regiment is the, the designation. These guys had come up there. So, you know, we're talking August now. These guys had been up there since June um, and they were there with, um, you know, they weren't infantry soldiers. Uh, obviously, they were soldiers, but they weren't infantry soldiers. They were engineers and they had all this heavy construction equipment, which you would uh, imagine, you know, dump trucks and graders and bulldozers and all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, yes, indeed, they got into the fight because at that spot, and if we can picture on our walking tour, we're in this, uh, I'm going to call it a park as a memorial park because there is another main memorial, which we'll get to, and I don't want to um, to take away from that. But um, yes, on the edge of the airfield, during the course of the battle, uh, American engineers manned um, machine guns and stayed off the Japanese, which was... Um, I just, you know, imagine your job is to go out there to build airstrips and before you know it, you're engaging the Japanese as they're trying to overrun what you've just built. So, um, you know, it's quite a story in itself that. I think it's interesting because to me, Milne Bay and the protection of the airfield, the defence of the airfields has always demonstrated what the Japanese should have done at Guadalcanal because it was the same thing. I mean, the force was obviously a lot larger that landed at Guadalcanal, the American force, but the same concept that, an enemy force lands to capture airfields that you're busy constructing. And it always struck me, I don't want to wander off on too much of a tangent, but it always struck me as bizarre that the Japanese at Guadalcanal had no troops there to defend the airfield, that when the Americans arrived, they really walked onto the strip without contest because it was simply occupied by labor troops in the majority. There there were very few combat troops there. So um, I think the Allies demonstrated at Milne Bay what the Japanese should have been doing at Guadalcanal, and the Guadalcanal campaign would have been quite different, I imagine, if there'd been some strong defence around that airfield and if uh, if the Americans hadn't been uh, so effective in simply marching in and, and capturing the airfield uh, without resistance. Indeed. And um, again, back to what we said earlier in the podcast, this uh, is uh, replicated all throughout the Pacific campaign, battle for the airfields, if you will. We don't you have to stop and think about that and put it into context. And you're right, the um, um, you know guys that have been put in there, as you say, to do labour force, end up turning into into frontline soldiers. Which you know, there's there's probably other accounts of that, certainly in the Second World War. But um, you're right. Look, you know, here we are um, in the in the you know 1942 at the height of the Pacific War, and you've got what are essentially non-combatant troops that find themselves in the thick of it. So leaving the Memorial Park at number three strip, David, where are we heading next? So the next um, the next uh, major, uh, I guess, site that we see, and uh, now we're going to start to um, use our imaginations because we're going to get to some more um, stuff that you can actually, that's tangible, that you can actually touch and see. But from, from um, the, the, the strip, we're going to make our way to um, KB Mission. And I just want people to picture them picture in in their minds as we walk the battlefield is approximately 11 kilometers from where the japanese um landed to up to where we are at the um at the um airstrip and kb mission is um the first i guess of the battle um uh, main battle points other than the airfields but you have to use your imagination on one side because we're we're um we're headed east now and to our left was the Stirling Mountain Range. So there is quite a dominating mountain range which runs the spine of the side of where we are on Milne Bay and a narrow road um, and then you you can see the water. Where we are at KB Mission, you can see out into the bay and it's not much of a, um, a, a stone's throw really to get a little bit more than a stone's throw, but you can see it and it's not far to get to the water. So KB Mission is the next, the next um, um, place. And 
I just uh, want to, I guess, to try and bring it to life. Um, from the Australian's point of view, <clears throat> we had Milne Force, and uh, and in Milne Force we had um, two uh, brigades. So each brigade has three infantry battalions in it, and we had a um, an AIF, which was the 18th Brigade. These are guys that later go on to fight. Um, at the Battle of the Northern Beachheads, which maybe we'll do a podcast on one day, uh, Matt. But these guys go and fight at Boona in particular. And the other the other one uh, that we have up there is the 7th Militia Brigade. And these guys were, uh, as if we remember back to the um, Kokoda podcast, these are militia troops. Now, they can't be sent outside of Australian uh, territory, but guess what? Papua is Australian territory. And the, um, the commander of Milne Force, um, his, um, I guess, uh, plan was, and rightly so, I guess, from from what he had available to him at the time, was to hold uh, his AIF um, guys back to defend um, the uh, airstrips. The militia had already been forward, and they get caught up in the um, in, in the throes of the Japanese to begin with. But um, um, you know, they are the ones that start to do the fighting to begin with. They're the guys who uh, take on the Japanese because. The commander wants to hold the AIF guys back to keep the prize, which, of course, is is the airfields. So what was the fighting like around KB Mission? So the fighting at KB Mission um, was quite intense. So um, to give you an idea, and I, I, I love this part of the story, not because it's, um, I mean, it would be pretty bad if you're a soldier there, but it just puts it in perspective. And I mentioned earlier to go to the War Memorial and see one of the um, um, the uh, the tankettes or the, the small tanks that the um, the Japanese had, because um, the one of the things the Japanese would do is they sent their they sent their tanks up uh, with the with their soldiers. For, I mean, they weren't infantry, the special naval landing force, but they were fighting as infantry soldiers behind the tanks. A lot of the fighting that happened, um, especially initially um, in in late August, there was done at night, and the um, uh, you know there's accounts of uh, the Japanese coming behind the tanks. Uh, up in the dark, and then the tanks putting their headlights on. And at the War Memorial, where you see the, um, the the actual tank that was there, now they have like a, where they actually turn the the light of the tank on, which is pretty, um, you know, amazing and sort of you know really um, highlights this point. And as they did that, blinding the Australians and the Japanese soldiers would peel off left and right of the tanks. Um, a str- it's important to note that we don't really have much forward of the airfields that can take out. These, even though they're small, you know, they're they're not huge, big, uh, main battle tanks. They're small uh, tanks, but they're armored vehicles, and um, they play an important role. In fact, the Japanese land them. They also land. They land two of them. They land extra crews in case the crews, indeed, the crews are taken out, and they replace the crews. And they also bring another vehicle up. Its primary purpose is to cart fuel for the tanks. So the Australians didn't have anything forward of the airfields to engage. Um, these vehicles with. Um, they had some uh, boys' anti-tank rifles, uh, but most of their weapons were, uh, you know, a rifle, grenade, and a range of small small arms like your Bren gun, your Tommy guns, those sorts of things. They did have uh, made uh, sticky bombs. So I guess for the listener, think about um, Private Ryan or one of those movies where they try and put the, the sticky bomb that sticks to the side of the tank. The only problem was... We're not in Europe. We're in the tropics, and actually, the whatever it was that was was allowing the um, you know, for the the the, the device to be stuck to it, uh, just became a mess, and indeed, it didn't stick to it. So, um, it was even though they're only small tanks, it was very difficult for the Australians to stop these guys, um, uh, without um, without proper um, weapons. To, to to take them out. And so they were of much advantage to, to the Japanese. And as we're walking kind of in reverse the way we're going, um, and we've just mentioned that the Americans were firing with their machine guns from the engineers, um, you know, the Japanese had an advantage and they got, as I said, they got 11 kilometer, kilometers up to the airfields. And uh, the fighting was done, as I said, at night. Uh, there was uh, unusual weather for that time of year. It's August. It's usually dry by comparison, but it had rained. The the, the road had become quagmire. You probably um, listeners will remember um, seeing images of Milne Bay, we, and we've mentioned the tank, and I mentioned the Bofors. But one of the iconic 
images of Milne Bay is soldiers literally heaving their legs through almost up to, you know, above the knee in mud because you can imagine um, uh, what tropical rain does on um, on a road that was really only advantage was that they'd cut down the, the palms, the coconut palms at that time to make corduroy on the road. So it was hellish. And, of course, you've got all the other stuff that comes with it. You've got malaria. Uh, this doesn't take long for dysentery. There's many accounts of the soldiers, um, of course, being sick with malaria. In fact, there's quite a high attrition rate with malaria overall. And, um, you know, uh, combined with the fact that um, communications were bad, even though it's over a small small distance and it's a relatively, um, you know, um, uh, I guess, linear battlefield in the sense that we're all walking along between the, uh, or the battles happening between this roadway and the, and the sea and the mountain range, but on the flat. So it would have been uh, quite, quite um, I would say, different to the Owen Stanleys up in the mountains, but had all of those, I guess, um, uh, impediments that you would expect with jungle fighting. How did they take the tanks out, David? Because I've seen the photos of the take of the tanks discarded on the side of the road. Well, there's a couple of things that ha- a couple of things that happened to the tanks. They took the crew of the tanks out. Uh, they did manage to eventually get up and um, and 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 take out the, the crew, as you said. One of the tanks ran out, but what was against them was the same thing that was against us, which happened to our um, vehicles, and that is that that became bogged. And as we walked past KB Mission there. Uh, when I take people there, I hold up the photo and if people can um, imagine, I'm sure anybody who's flicked through a book of the Pacific uh, um, campaigns and you see anything to do with Milne Bay, the tanks off to the side of the road, um, the road just became unpassable and uh, one of the tanks actually ran out of fuel. Amazing. And what's next on our walk across the Milne Bay battlefield after we leave KB Mission? So we're going to take a little pit stop where we are, and we're going to sort of walk in, in, in off towards the, um, um, to the, to the sea. Just, just, and this is not in the battle per se, but it's worth having a look at on the battlefield. There is an, a massive amount of concrete. I don't know how many tons the Americans must have uh, made there, both prior and after the Battle of Milne Bay. But you can duck off down a path. There's some huts, some native huts and a little settlement there. And you go off into the bush and there is actually quite a lot of um, concrete foundations. And you can see where pipes and, and um, you know, they would have had running water in the sewer and all that. And obviously there's some um, uh, rails with the, that they would, could launch, um, I guess, some sort of... Um, boats down into the ocean itself and this was all built a lot of it was built post the battle but still during the war and it's just amazing like you it is the trees have sort of reclaimed it it kind of conjures up um you know uh seeing photos of thailand with it where the um temples are and all the all the um you know the trees are growing the roots are growing through all the all the stonework probably not quite on that scale but on the ground it is absolutely um amazing when you realize that you're standing on this concrete that was laid during the second world war and i'm talking uh football fields of concrete underfoot it's um so it's not part of the battle but it's worth mentioning because obviously when you're walking a battlefield you love to see things tangible things that you can uh see not just use your imagination And, and this just shows the um level of the construction and the activity that had gone on into what obviously the allies thought were was a very important place it's one of the fascinating things about walking these islands of the Pacific. I've done it everywhere from Bougainville to through the Solomon Islands and New Guinea and uh, and further afield even. But you find these sites where construction had occurred during the war, and as you say, is now being reclaimed by nature and the jungle. And it is that it is that juxtaposition, isn't it? It does demonstrate what a fierce and hostile environment this is. And yet we came in and we built airfields and we built buildings and sewers and and other construction works to try and tame the jungle. But then as soon as we left, the, the mother nature comes back. It's a, it's a, they're really extraordinary battlefields, particularly for people who've spent a lot of time just walking Europe and uh, the fields of France. It's, they're quite extraordinary places. Indeed. And, and, and what I just mentioned there, Matt, really highlights to you, there aren't, isn't a lot of places, certainly you wouldn't see it at the Northern Beachheads or on Kokoda. Um, I've been all over the, the um, Guadalcanal battlefields, but for, for me, seeing this amount of what was left of this activity in the Pacific, even Rabaul, there's lots of stuff in Rabaul, but this hits home to me. And um, 
I just um, <clears throat> before we move on, on you know, if we, we go down and we have a look at all of the um, of, of that area that was left over, because we're not near the main town of of um, of Milne Bay at Alatau. We're not we're not quite there yet. We're heading towards it, and we'll be there soon. But we've taken this short diversion, and we're back back up onto the main road. And I I just want listeners and uh, to picture what you'd be seeing. Um, you know, hopefully it's not a rainy day when you would be walking it, but uh, it's usually quite hot and humid. Um, by this stage, by the time we'd landed and started our walk and done those detours, we'd be heading towards, you know, at least if we got on the early flight, we would be, you know, it'd be coming to around about 11 o'clock now. And we'd, as I said, we'd be facing towards, looking towards the town from where the Japanese came. And on your left-hand side, big mountain range out to the, uh, to your right is the ocean. And you're, um, you know, if there's no cars going past, you're looking at a very thin strip, no curb or guttering, just a thin strip of bitumen. And you've got, there is palm oil, as I said, but near near the um, near to the roadway, the ju- jungle and the scrub would be very similar to what it would have been during the war, you know, still with the po- coconut palms. And there was lots of coconut palms in this area during the world, very similar to to um, to the northern beachheads of, of Papua where the Kokoda campaign ends. So it's, it's that sort of uh, scrub. Uh, and bush and jungle and I just you know I just wanted to if I may to to bring home Matt one of the um, and I've got a quote here from one of the soldiers that wrote a letter home which spoke about the conditions at Mil- Milne Bay and remember at the time in August September 42 should be really the dry it was unusually wet for this time in 1942 and a soldier wrote he said even without the war Milne Bay would have been a hell hole it was a terrible place the sun hardly ever shined and it rained all the time. It was stinking hot and bog holes everywhere. It was a disease-ridden place. It was terrible. And um, I don't want to turn people off going, Matt, because it's a, it's it's actually got some beautiful – the bay itself is magnificent. But, um, yeah, like everything, the weather plays an important uh, role in it. And, um, you know, it would have been, you know, it would have been pretty pretty shit, to be quite frank, for the soldiers there. I always think that as well about when we read about these battles is that battles always seem to be fought in the most far-flung corners of the, the most hostile environments. And even as, as, as that quote says, even without the war, these places would be a challenge. Um, but uh, with people shooting at you, it just uh, it beggars belief. And you get that experience at Kokoda. You get that experience when you go to the battlefields today of the Pacific is you do have to deal with the rain and the mud and the, and the, and the conditions, the mosquitoes and it, it can be a challenge. Nothing like what the men had to go through, but uh, but these are challenging environments. And um, what's the what's the next one we're going to come to in this uh, in this challenging environment? Uh, well, we're going to continue our walk down, and we're heading towards the town. It's a bit of a it's still a bit of a um, it's still a bit of a walk, but um, you know, unlike the the, the 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 what it would have been like back in 1942, it starts to open up. There's a um, a wonderful. Uh, I actually think it's probably, to my mind, it's probably the. Uh, if you take out Isarava high up in the in the mountains for the the four um, granite pillars in the middle of the jungle, this for me would be uh, number two, on the places to see in terms of a memorial in um, in the Pacific. And the main memorial at Milne Bay is on the waterfront. It's in the centre of the town. Um, so by now we've come. Um, you know, I guess halfway, we'll call it. Um, not quite, but it is halfway, and it is the centre of the town, and it has got this wonderful um, uh, setting with this main cenotaph. It's got these wonderful um, uh, interpretive panels that you just go down some stairs and you're actually on the water, and obviously it tells you all about the um, the battles and all those things that we've just spoken about, the airfields and all of all of the, um, the history. But... It's this wonderful setting, and um, unlike that, <laughs> moving away from that soldier's quote, you're looking out into this sparkling, uh, magnificent bay. You've got a market on one side, uh, which is like a big, um, uh, like shed, I guess, that's high up in the air, a big shelter, and behind the, or directly opposite the mem- the memorial, you cross a road, and um, there's a there's a there's another road that goes up past some shops, and it's only very small. It's only a small shopping strip if you will with local shops but that road takes you up to um um 
to usually the hotels in particular the hotel that that I stay up at the lodge up there which is on the high ground that looks down over the bay as well so it is a hub and it's the center of Milne Bay to the left of the memorial there is the port you can see in the distance which we'll end up walking past the road that turns down it later on but that's the big um I guess, uh, dock, if you will, where the cruise ships come in, because a lot of people, most Australians that visit Milne Bay for for tourism purposes probably go in there on cruise ships when the cruise ships um, were were um, were off pre, pre-COVID pre there. So um, it's this wonderful hub. Um, it was the scene of, um, of the fighting of the Japanese pushing through, going back up towards those airstrips, and then later on the tide turning and the Australians pushing them back past there. But it is just a magnificent stone memorial. I was there for the 75th anniversary of Milne Bay, um, 75 years to the day, five years ago. And to me, it is probably only second to Isarava in terms of uh, a magnificent memorial to um, in the Pacific for me, or in New Guinea at least. Sounds amazing, David. And um, what's, the, what's the next stop after we leave the town? Well... Um, what I do then is I take a break from um, walking um, this the, the, the main part of the um, – because we're going to head down. The next stop is going to be a place called Cameron Springs. But before we do that, there's a roadway, which is um, the only hill. I promise it's the only hill, and it's a hill like walking up a street. Imagine a suburban street, but, again, no curve and guttering, and we walk – up to the top of it, and there is a. It starts to flatten out a bit, and I guess for want of a better term, um, it is a lookout, and it allows you to look out over the bay. And from there, you can actually see uh, to your right, back up to where we came from, um, where the where the airstrips are. You can look out over Milne Bay itself, the beautiful Milne Bay, and you can look down to to your left where we're going to go, and that's of course where where the where the um, Japanese landed. So it's worth. It's a little bit extra walk. And we usually have lunch up there and you get a chance to take the battlefield in perspective. Because one of the things, Matt, I, I always say, like, um, you know, yourself, if you go and do Gallipoli in the Western Front, it's very important to put the battlefield in perspective. And the best way to do that is to have a bird's eye view, so to speak. That's very difficult in the jungles. So the other things like Kokoda that I, I that we spoke about in previous podcasts, it, that's difficult to do because you've got high canopy and, you you know, even if you fly over it, it's hard to put it in perspective. But at Milne Bay, it gives you the vantage point of being up on the lookout and being able to see exactly um what what the battle battlefield is and to be able to put it all in perspective okay the japanese landed down to my left if you're at the um at the uh, lookout and we can see where the airfields were where we've come from up to our right and i think um when you put that in perspective um it brings it makes it rationalize it to a certain degree in your own mind of how the battlefield the layout of it is and milne bay i must say is is quite um um, for even a novice wanting to uh, walk a battlefield, uh, as I said, it's only 11 kilometres. A lot happened in a short amount of space. As I said, the tanks and the airfields been trying to be taken and the planes coming in and all that sort of stuff. But you can really get an overview and you can see um, what the fighting was like in, in a snapshot from being up on the lookout. So it's definitely worth the detour. So back down from our little detour at the lookout. What uh, what are we seeing next? Back down to the um, to the to the uh, uh, main part of the town, and then we start to make our um, <clears throat> our way um, down towards the um, uh, to where the Japanese landed. But we're not quite there yet. The next the next spot um, that we we come to is a place called Cameron Springs. Uh, there is a freshwater spring there. It's literally on the side of the road that you can see, and this is the location here where in the um at the start of the um Milne Bay fighting um some militia units actually got cut off from or some men rather some militia men got cut off from the um from the main force and the message was still trying to get back as to the intelligence of how many Japanese had landed what was going on and um you've got a steep embankment where this spring is and there's a track that leads up towards the um, that goes off into the Sterling Mountain Ranges, and it was in this vicinity. You literally, if you could imagine, you're on the roadway and you're looking up at like a an embankment with the spring, and then you look up into the scrub. And again, this is a a good example at Milne Bay where the the bush hasn't changed because of infrastructure or the um or, or the or the um, palm oil. But you can see where the um, 
the type of ground that the Australians were in. And basically this area here, um, the Japanese had got to, they started to, to not flounder, but they started to get bogged down in this spot as they're trying to make their way to the, um, um, to the airfields. And you have Australian accounts from the militia where they engage the Japanese um, and the Japanese would use the tricks where they try and call out uh, words in English, trying to draw, draw the Australians out. And there was some really fierce fighting around here, which included, um, you know, rifle and, uh, and, and in particular bayonet up there. So it was, uh, it would have been quite a, a ghastly place if you were uh, a young militiaman, hadn't fought any enemy before. You are in the jungle. It is dark. It is cold. It is wet because it's raining. You've got an enemy that's calling out words to you in English to try and get you to, to come out. It, uh, it would have been a um, horrendous place to fight. And by now, we're well, well, let's say we are halfway or thereabouts. So we're five or six kilometres away from where the main um, Allies concentration around the airfields were. So you would have certainly been out, out on your own and you would have felt isolated and cut off from the rest of the guys. Shocking stuff too. And these militiamen hadn't had a lot of training and a lot of experience on the battlefield, had they? They were pretty green when they met the Japanese for the first time. Yeah, so um, back to that claim at the start about the first um, defeat on land by 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 um, of the Japanese on land. So, you know, the, the, the first lot of uh, Australian soldiers that are engaging, you're right, they, are, they haven't. Um, these are guys, I mean, um, that had done... You know they'd done plenty of training. Uh, like um, some of them had been in the in the interwar period in the militia, but these are militia units which have got a lot of men in their ranks who are they're not boys. They are men, but they are men that have been um, called up to do um, compulsory military service. And you know a lot of them from Queensland, they would have been on their farms or they would have been, you know, doing whatever they did in their normal life. And then a few months later, they're um, only able to go onto Australian territory, but they find themselves in at this time in history, you know, August, September 42, you're at the height of the war in the Pacific and you're fighting um, an enemy uh, to at this point had never had never really known defeat on, on the ground. So yeah, it was and, and the soldiers that are coming that you're fighting up against, they'd had already participated in, in, in combat. So it would have been quite a um, quite a shock to the system, I would suggest, for a lot of these these guys. In fact, it would have been um, it would have been something that I, I couldn't I couldn't even begin to imagine in my mind what what you would have felt as being one of those young soldiers. Absolutely. There's uh, there's actually only a couple more sites left on our walk. Um, what are we uh, what are we seeing next? So in terms of because there's a battlefield walk, um, there's there's a couple of things left to see, uh, and I think they're um, I think they are not as quiet as as what we had at the other end of the of of Milne Bay. But as we make our way along, um, you can um, you cross a you, there's there's, uh, there's in a couple of places along where we're walking, there are there are uh, creeks or rivers, if you will, which do feature if you go deep into the history you feature and they do become a bit of a, a hazard for and, and an obstacle for both the japanese and the australians so when we leave cameron springs we're going to walk over a bridge and we continue on and there's actually a place because we're getting down to the guts of where the japanese landed where they unloaded their tanks and did all that sort of stuff and the two th main things that i point out is that there is still the remnants of one of the japanese landing barges in the in the uh, in the sea um there's not much left of course because 80 years would would deteriorate it but you can you can see um one of these barges uh you can see the the hull or what is left of it in quite shallow water i mean it would only be i'd suggest you know if you jumped in the water it would only there's like there's like a rock and bank uh, uh, like a, a foundation or, or um you know, a seawall that they've sort of made and there's, there's stones in the, um, instead of sand in this location, but you can see under the water only in a, in a less than a metre of water, you can see the outline of the, the hull of one of those Japanese landing barges, which just, I guess, was, you know, it was abandoned and left to, left to, to ride and it's still there. So you can still see that. I mean, I don't know how long it'll be there for, and it probably was uh, much bigger in a day before my time going up there, but it brings it home and this is in the spot where the Japanese landed and unloaded those men. So it's it's definitely worth seeing. The next thing uh, that I'd like to move on to um, from the battlefield walking part of it is that you you do uh, find 
uh, throughout the uh, PNG. In the immediate uh, years after the war, the Australian government put up some um, large metal, um, I guess they're bronze um, or some sort of heavy, you know, heavy type metal of these interpretation plaques. They're just text and they talk about different places. And a lot of them, in fact, if anybody had gone through Popendetta of Dunkirkota, you would see that most of them were recalled in from where they once stood on the actual battlefields and they brought into a central location. But to my mind, one of the only ones I know that's in the spot where um, where the battle actually took place, it's still still surviving and hanging up, is at a place called the Crossroads. And that's this is towards the end of our, our, our walk. And there is one there that recognises the Victoria Cross action of, um, of John French. And he, uh, like Bruce Kingsbury, I guess, uh, have a couple of things in common. One, um, that they were both uh, got the highest award for valour on Australian soil. So obviously they're the two that happen in Papua, uh, which is very distinct. Kingsbury happens um, in, in uh, first at Isarava, but on the, uh, in August and then the 4th of September, um, uh, Corporal John French of the 2nd 9th Battalion. So these are the AIF guys. So uh, Klaus, the commander of uh, Milne Force, he'd released the uh, um, the AIF guys to do the battle and they are the ones that really pursue and chase the Japanese back to where they landed. And, um, you know, the story of uh, John French is amazing. The plaque is still there roughly in the spot. It says near to this spot. And basically um, Jack French... Uh, grabbed, uh, you know, he took, ordered his men to took cover and the Japanese were making a stand with machine guns and fr and French ran forward and he silenced um, the first two posts. He, he, he rushed them and threw grenades at them. So this is almost, you know, this is like World War One stuff here. And he had, because he was a section commander, he had a Tommy gun, a Thompson submachine gun, and he was firing from his hip. And in the course of doing this, he, um, he, he, he was, he was shot. He'd been hit and, um, um, you know, he managed to take out these these Japanese machine gun posts, and the rest of his section came up behind him. But unfortunately, he'd um, when he got to the third pit, he had he had died. So again, he didn't know that his action resulted in the Victoria Cross, but he was um, posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. He's buried at Bamana War Cemetery, as long with Bruce Kingsbury, and they're the two Victoria Crosses that were won in um, in the. Um, in, the, in, in Papua, in, on Australian soil. And um, I think it's remarkable that, one, you can go to the actual spot where this VC action happens, but the original plaque to it is is still there in situ. And there's a little memorial on the side of the road. It's called the Crossroads because several roads meet there. But, um, um, you know, it's amazing that you can be on that actual spot where French um, rushed, um, you know, these machine gun posts and where the action happened. And it's funny because it's just next to it now. There's like a modern, you know, I think it's, it's a tin style, you know, color bond sort of style. Must be some sort of, um, you know, business or something. It just it just happened here. But back in the day, that would have been scrub. And um, here we have uh, a Victoria Cross action, which resulted in the second Victoria Cross one on Australian soil. These VC actions of the Pacific War are just extraordinary, aren't they, David? I mean, every time you come across one, it involves just that sort of story. One man rushing forward. There's usually grenades and some sort of submachine gun involved, and just, just, uh, just raw heroics, which is what was required in this fighting. The fighting was man to man. It was in tough jungle conditions. You know, the same similar fighting that we we always find in jungles. You know, we talk about Vietnam veterans. They tell the same story. Very close quarter fighting. Not a lot of observation at night in the dark. Enemy all around you, and it's amazing how often. It, there could be hundreds and hundreds of men on the battlefield, but it takes that one man to step forward and do something extraordinary. There, all of these VC actions of the Second World War are, in the Pacific are pretty much the same, aren't they? They are, and um, you know, as the Milne Bay is is a small smaller battlefield in terms of distance to a lot of the other places, it's such a significant one. And um, I've just um, you know want to sort of close off where um, French got the, did the VC action uh, with something that's very poignant. Um, so, you know, to recap, the Japanese land, they land these two tanks, they land around 2,000 um, Special Naval Landing Force. They are making their way along um, a roadway, plus these places that we went, you know, um, uh, Cameron Springs up to Alatau through to... Um, the KB mission and up to 
where the airfields were, and then they get pushed back. They lose their tanks. The Australians release the AIF guys after the militia fought the Japanese, and they push them back. Obviously, French was an AIF guy from the second ninth. They get pushed back to the sea and they go. But um, it's over fairly quickly, you know, um, but it was decisive. It was in horrendous conditions because of the weather. Came with all of those things that you get anywhere else in in the Pacific, and you know even um, um, uh, Field Marshal uh, Slim William Slim of the um, uh, the British Army in Burma, he had had, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he had said something along the lines of you know um, Australian troops had inflicted the first um, significant victory at Milne Bay, and their um, that that defeat of the Japanese on land had spurred them on to knowing that if Australian soldiers could break the invincibility of the Japanese, that they could as well. And that's the British Army fighting the Japanese in Burma, which obviously is a big, much bigger campaign, etc. But if, you know, the heroic deeds of men like French at Milne Bay, and yes, there was Americans there, but certainly the, the big fighting uh, was done by Australian militia and AIF guys. And, um, yeah, they, their, their success... Um, I guess was uh, a resounding morale lifter to all the other Allied forces that were around around the Pacific, um, fighting the Japanese, who, as I said before, had not been stopped on land until this point. Just extraordinary, David. Is there is there anything else for us to see today on the battlefield before we before we wrap it up? <clears throat> yeah. So there is stuff at Milne Bay uh, that because um, we've sort of followed, we did take that tour to detour earlier on to see whether the, the foundations and a lot were post the battle, I understand, but it puts in perspective how much the Allies um, valued Milne Bay because of its locality and what it could do. But there is some areas just behind where we are now uh, out into the scrub where you can see there's some vehicle, there's some vehicle wrecks. There's also some large... Um, it's quite amazing. You go into uh, an area where it's a village, really. It's people live there, and um, you you know you can imagine the the, the, the the huts made out of the bush materials. And um, up behind it, there's these huge um, tanks. I assume that they are. I haven't actually located what why they are there, but there's these big tanks, and I don't mean tanks as in what the Japanese brought with them. I'm talking about tanks that I would assume would have held fuel. Um, and they're quite large. They're almost like they've been beached up into the bush. There's that. There is an area um, where there is a great collection of stuff that a local fellow has of both Japanese and Australian gear. So people who like to see, you know, the relics, the rusted relics. As uh, last time I was there, there's like Bren guns and there's a Tommy gun and there's, um, you know, plenty of Japanese rifles and there's some bayonets and, of course, all the other ordnance that goes with it. There's the Australian grenades, which stand out, the Japanese grenades, which are a bit smaller. There's a whole collection of them. They're probably not all from that one area. This guy is, you know, he charges you a small fee to to look at what he calls his museum, and it is just a collection of detritus that's come out of the jungle. But, again, there's lots to see um, um, just under the surface, which that shows you that the, even though it was 80 years ago, the, the remnants and the signs of it are still there and the people are still living with that stuff every day of their lives. Well, David, it's just an extraordinary place and I, I'm loving revealing some of these lesser known but but vital actions that took place during the Pacific War and getting a chance to virtually walk the ground as, you know, very few of us have the privilege of doing. It's uh, I think we're all very jealous that you get to head over there all the time and, and walk these uh, these remarkable sites. But um, this one's been pretty special and uh, we will uh, we'll definitely get you back on again to talk about some other ones. What about the reality? Are you walking Kokoda anytime soon? Are you heading back up to PNG to, uh, to, to, to explore the battlefields again in the near future? I will be. I'm very lucky to be going up um, in August to go and do a Kokoda trip um, north to south from Kokoda to Owers Corner and, of course, going to, to um, one of the um, very surreal places for me, which is Bamana War Cemetery, where, of course, I'll go past men like Jack French that is buried there. Um, and uh, after that, I've got a, something that I really like to get across to people with the battlefield touring of PNG, because a lot of people just think that it's about walking and trekking in the jungle, but it couldn't be um, uh, further from the truth, because there is a lot of battlefields in the Pacific that are accessible. Milne Bay, which we just did, is very um, accessible. At the end of the year, I've got a non-trekking uh, trip going up to visit um, the key things around um, 
uh, the battles in, in Papua. So, you know, Owa's Corner and uh, Bamana and all that and going to Kokoda itself and going out to the northern beachheads. But she can also do as a side trip, come out to the battlefield of Milne Bay 80 years after the battle for the anniversary. Not well, too that's late. something we love. We love doing, David, at Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours, as you are our Kokoda guy, and uh, that's a very popular trip to get to Kokoda without having to trek. So flying in by light aircraft and, and seeing those sites, it's become a very popular way to do it for people who uh, who obviously don't have the ability or the desire to spend ten or eleven days trekking the track, um, mate. It's an absolute privilege to talk to you every time. These are exciting battlefields to visit, telling important stories. And, uh, mate, I'm just uh, really looking forward to the next one. Thanks for joining us, David. No worries. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Matt.